On behalf of Drs. Pamela Valentine and Dr. Egon Janssen and their respective boards, uh, welcome to the 15th installment of the AI IHE uh, Health Policy Speaker Series. Uh, my name is Dr. Andy Chuck. I'm Director of Economic Evaluation and Analytics at the IHE. Um, welcome to you all. Uh, it's my honor to uh, introduce and welcome Mr. Omar Ishraq, Chairman and CEO of Medtronic. Um, you have his bio, so I won't repeat it back to you. Suffice to say that we are very privileged to hear from Omar today, being a global leader and having so much experience from various jurisdictions around the world, bringing that knowledge and wisdom to share with us this morning. Um, the title of his talk is Leading the Shift to Value-Based Healthcare, and this presentation is extremely timely as we're all working very hard here in Alberta to not only be a value maximizer in terms of how we fund and manage our health innovation, but to also be a jurisdiction that's recognized for developing, testing, and scaling and spreading innovation here. And not only within our borders, but also scaling and spreading elsewhere based on lessons learned and, and, uh, and evidence generated. So with that being said, um, thank you very much for joining us, uh, Omar. Um, we are all very excited to hear your talk. And, with, and uh, so could the audience please uh, join me in welcoming Mr. Ishraq to the podium. Thank you. Thank you for that kind introduction, and it's, uh, it's good morning to everyone, and it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, you know, I spent yesterday uh, talking to uh, many people, and many of you, I think, are in the audience, uh, and I had a pretty, um, <clears throat> I was quite impressed with the, uh, not only the opportunity uh, in, in leading the shift to value-based healthcare in Alberta, but also the, uh, the, the focus of, uh, of, of almost everyone I talked to on the subject. Uh, I think uh, you've got an intent, I think you've got a structure, you've got the capabilities here, uh, you've got a sort of a, in relative terms, a contained size of population, and uh, you've got a very progressive mindset and then people with the right skill sets. So, uh, um, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if, uh, if Alberta takes a, a real leading position uh, in this journey. Uh, and, you know, look, I, last night I went through these slides and in fact, I made it a little deeper than I normally would in a broad audience because of what I heard yesterday, because of the depth that you already have. Uh, so um, please bear with me with that, and, um, and uh, I'll be glad actually to have a dialogue at the, at the end of uh, my, my talk, if you like, uh, and, and get your insights, get your questions, and, um, and maybe learn a little bit from you and, and your thought process. So without further ado, uh, let me jump into the talk. And um, I usually start with the slide because it kind of gives perspective on healthcare. Um, and th this is something that we uh, kind of, th uh, through our own thought process, came up with. Uh, but it is really a reflection of how everybody in healthcare thinks. Uh, th there are three fundamental areas in healthcare which, uh, no matter where you are in the world or who you are in healthcare, you deal with. Uh, one is uh, a continued and uh, a continuing quest to improve clinical outcomes. I think that journey is never going to go away. I think our, our ability, our collective ability to improve outcomes through technology and through improved understanding of, uh, of clinical medicine, uh, that's a journey that uh, will never stop. Uh, because, uh, I mean, most of you know this, many of you are physicians in the audience, but others know as well. The human body is incredibly complex and uh, any time you look at any, any portion of it, uh, one cannot be but just blown away at how it all works, and we don't understand it all. And as we do and improve our understanding, I'm sure there'll be things that we will do that'll help us extend life, um, you know, recover from illnesses more quickly, uh, prevent illnesses perhaps, uh, and all of that will continue to happen. So healthcare is never going to be technologically mature. If anyone ever tells you that, you know, they're not thinking about this the right way. There, there's nothing in healthcare that ever can be mature because, because our desire to improve things is just never going to go away. So that's a, that's a basic backdrop about healthcare which we can never forget. Uh, second, and, and equally um, sort of interesting, but not always obvious, is the fact that uh, equality in, in providing access is actually a, a very uh, uh, serious and uh, a difficult problem to address. Uh, you know, yesterday I heard a lot about how uh, in rural Canada in, uh, or in rural Alberta to the Aboriginal population, 
you know, the healthcare uh, access is, uh, is significantly worse than in the rest of the population, in the cities and amongst um, other people with other ethnic backgrounds. Uh, as you all know, that problem is only amplified by orders of magnitude if you look around the world. But the, uh, <clears throat> the, the important point about that is that uh, it is not only a matter of affordability. You know, there are places like Canada where, you know, the government essentially pays for everything. Or the UK where people, where the government pays for everything. And there's lots of countries like that where affordability should not be an issue. And yes, there's massive disparities in healthcare, in access to healthcare. Uh, now, when you cannot afford it, obviously the problem gets even worse. Uh, but, uh, and then what's also... Um, uh, challenging in many ways and, and humbling in many ways is the fact that therapies that are established standard of care, I mean, we're not talking about the latest thing like transcatheter valves or something like that. We're talking about pacemakers. We're talking about things that have been in standard of care for, for decades and are still not accessible to many people who can afford them. And, you know, this is not just me as a uh, a CEO of a technology company saying, hey, buy more technology. This is about, you know, you put a pacemaker in somebody, it extends someone's life by decades. And so if you think about it in that context, and that's just one therapy, if you just think about it in that context, uh, look at the opportunity, the talent, the lives that we're essentially leaving on the table. And so uh, the, the, that's, that's a parallel journey that we all have to be on, is to equalize access. And uh, it's probably impossible to do that you know, uniformly everywhere in the world instantly, but you cannot ignore it. And, and I think it's all our collective responsibility to make sure that access is provided to all. And then finally, in healthcare, uh, there is this alarming increase in cost. For something, for, 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 for something where, where, in fact, healthcare is getting better. And in principle, if healthcare gets better, costs should be reduced because uh, you know, people have higher quality of life. Uh, they should have less severe treatments, or if it is, it's more limited. And in fact, uh, you know, economic models are made when new technologies are introduced, and new therapies introduced, which suggest that you in fact have a payback in quality of life years and so on. But it doesn't seem to work out. And it's primarily because we find that the, uh, that the, the accountability in healthcare is not clear, that there's inefficiencies in the system, there's enormous wastage, there's, uh, and in the end of the day, there is a lack of clear accountability for realizing all the benefits. And although I put that third on this page, if you like, uh, in many ways, it, if it's not addressed, if this problem of optimizing costs and efficiencies is not addressed, it'll limit our ability to improve clinical outcomes because we will not invest in those areas because we won't have money. Uh, and, uh, you know, we'll have systems that uh, waste all the good work that we do. Uh, and we're still, all the work isn't that good because we never measure it. And so it's highly inefficient in, in many ways. So, so these, are, these are three what we call universal healthcare needs and three areas of focus that Medtronic has as a company. What I'll talk about today, uh, based on the title of the, of, the slide, of, the, of the talk, is essentially around optimizing costs and efficiencies, and that's what we call uh, our journey in value-based healthcare. Now, we've tried different things. Uh, you know, all kinds of efforts, everything in, in every country has done different things, all the way from... Uh, for lack of a better word, rationing to, uh, to uh, you know, incentives of different sorts, uh, to uh, uh, very strict policing measures, uh, all kinds of different things. But costs seem to continue to go up. I, I think we made some headway in different countries and in pockets. But overall, in general, in, especially in developed countries, this is an issue. In emerging markets, it's less of an issue today only because the spend is so little that uh, you know, when you're spending 2% of GDP in healthcare, uh, cost inflation is not your biggest problem, access probably is. But in developed countries where access is, is better in, in, on average, uh, the costs are, are clearly an issue and, and whatever we're doing today is not enough. However, there is a, there is a clear um, sort of convergence and, and every year I see a growing convergence amongst all stakeholders uh, that, that, that this is a real issue and this must be addressed. And, but at the same time, there's a, there's a very fragmented system with many, many stakeholders 
And in the end, uh, you know, there has to be some leadership. Uh, and uh, we find in Medtronic that it is pretty critical for us to be in, in, in a leadership position, position in this journey for a variety of reasons, which I'll come to in a second. Um, you know, this is recognized by a lot of people. I mean, these are some, uh, some examples uh, of um, institutions that are well-known or individuals that are well-known who've, uh, who've uh, kind of tried to define uh, what, what value is in healthcare. I like my, Michael Porter's definition um, a lot in that um, it, it, is, it is what uh, matters to patients. It's benefits that matter to patients uh, at a given cost. Uh, ICHOM is another body that we've worked with a lot and they've been very precise about this definition. Um, but these are in many ways uh, a little more precise. When I talk in general about value-based healthcare uh, amongst people around the world, you know, immediate um, sort of understanding of that concept can vary all the way from prevention to, uh, to incentives to improve process uh, to value the way it's defined here, which is outcomes oriented. So any one of those uh, sort of um, uh, interpretations of the word value is used in healthcare. And as you can imagine, the actions related to do prevention versus improving process quality versus a focus on outcomes, you know, the actions may have some overlap, but the focus is different. And so we need to be clear, it's not that these aren't all important, but, um, but in many ways we kind of tend to talk past each other. So it's important to uh, get our nomenclature right, to uh, have clear communication around this, and, and you know, we'll, we'll attempt to do this. Now, we, we do feel at Medtronic that this is pretty critical for us, and why is it critical? It's critical because we spend a lot of money investing in R&D. We spend, you know, $2 billion a year in R&D. And the whole intent of that R&D is to devise technologies through which uh, we can improve outcomes. And today there is no way of um, objectively measuring whether we have indeed improved outcomes or not. You know, we, we are pretty rigorous about it. We do clinical trials, we gather evidence, but whether those results of a clinical trial have actually translated into the real world or not, uh, first, we're not accountable for it. Second, we don't have any real evidence that it actually happens at the level that we expect during clinical trials. And that's not only us, it's all the other medical device companies, and if you put all that together, the money that's spent on R&D is a lot more than what we spend, perhaps 10 times as much. And all of that money that's been spent, uh, you know, people try to recover by saying, hey, you know, increase my prices and so that I can pay for more R&D. Well, you know, that's a, that's a legitimate ask, but at the same time, uh, people who are paying for it, unless they can objectively see the value, you know, it, it's based on somebody's sort of brochure or somebody's persuasive powers. And uh, while that works to a certain degree, we don't think that's a healthy way or an efficient way to operate. Instead, if you could get to a situation where uh, we actually got paid for the outcomes that we promised that we will generate, I think we would produce better outcomes, we would make the system more efficient, and sure, we will find places where outcomes haven't been improved and we shouldn't be paid for that. Uh, but that'll make us better, and make us all of us better. And so we think that this is the right thing for Medtronic. We think in the long term this is the only thing that can protect our ability to, for, for continued investment and innovation. And it's a journey that we have to be on. And because there's such a lot of sort of noise around this, uh, it's important for us to lead. It's not a decision we take lightly because it uh, makes us uh, to some degree, uh, at least for a portion of our time, focus on things that we haven't focused on. It forces us to invest in areas for which we're not comfortable even calculating the returns. And, uh, and so it's not something that we just take lightly. But uh, every time we go through this internally, we debate about it internally, we come to the conclusion that we don't have a choice. Because for the long-term sustainability for Medtronic, for the healthcare industry, and for the medtech industry in particular, value-based healthcare is not an option. It's a necessity. And it's something that, in fact, will improve our ability to provide healthcare rather than constrain us in some way or distract us. So, so that's why we're in this journey, and we also realize that this is not something that we can do alone. 
This is something that we need to engage others, and we need to move the whole healthcare system to a value-based system. Us alone, moving to a value-based system doesn't do anything. We cannot do it because it depends on other people changing their business models, and you know, uh, as well as us. You know, our business model cannot change unless our partner's business model changes as well because we work with others. So this is a collective journey. It is one that we don't have a choice in, and it's one that we're excited to lead. And I personally found it extremely stimulating trying to understand uh, value-based healthcare, learn it, it's complex. But I firmly believe after having kind of uh, tried to understand it and study it that it's something that is completely doable. It's not easy, but it's doable. It's completely within our capacity as, uh, as, as individuals and as teams to be able to uh, get to a better place in healthcare. So let me start with the absolute basics. And the basics um, uh, are important because of the comment that I made earlier, that uh, what do we do in this, in this area? Because uh, sure, prevention also has an element of value-based healthcare in it, but it's not something that we're in. And then broadly speaking, healthcare can be divided into these two arms, people with disease and people without disease. And the reason I state that is because the expectation of someone interfacing a healthcare system without disease is different from someone who has disease. In fact, the identification of people who have disease is much clearer and easier in many ways uh, than for people without disease. So the starting points, the end points, the expectations are different from a pr primary prevention perspective versus a disease management perspective. And so our focus on value-based healthcare is around people with disease and more precisely people with chronic disease. We do some non-chronic like uh, emergency uh, accidents and trauma and so on, uh, but, but primarily the big spend in healthcare is in chronic disease and our focus as a company is mostly in chronic disease. So what I'll talk to you about is value-based healthcare in the context of chronic disease. Uh, and again, uh, like I said, uh, when you put this whole thing in, 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 in overall perspective and you do definitions, it's important that you have that baseline so you stay focused in the conversation. The objective, therefore, of, uh, of chronic disease is in the end to improve outcomes and to be more precise. Even chronic disease can be segmented in many ways. Uh, there is there's intensive management of chronic disease. It doesn't mean that the condition is always acute. Uh, type 1 diabetes is a great example where, where, the, where the management of chronic disease is very interventional. Uh, but at the same time, if managed correctly, a person with type 1 diabetes can leave, live a completely normal life. They can be athletes. They can do all kinds of activities, uh, anything they want virtually. Their lifespans are, are almost equivalent to uh, people without uh, diabetes if, if it's managed correctly from onset uh, all the way through. But at the same time, even with those people, a single miss in that interventional management process can actually be fatal. Uh, you know, uh, uh, hypoglycemia or uh, you know, you know can, can 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 kill somebody. Uh, and so, um, you know, improper management uh, has got catastrophic consequences. And so that's why we call that as an example of intensive management of chronic care. So you always need to be managing this person with little room for error. There are other diseases like that, some where recovery isn't that straightforward. Uh, Late-stage heart failure is an example. Uh, End-stage renal disease is another example. But these are, these are intensively managed uh, chronic conditions where the management of that condition takes over. That means if you mismanage that patient, you'll have catastrophic consequences. That's what we call intensively managed uh, uh, chronic, uh, chronic conditions. Now, in all of those situations, you've got a level of comorbidities, but the difference between intensive and non-intensive is that the intensive management takes over. You may have other conditions, but if you miss the intervention, you're, you know, you're in trouble. Non-intensive can also be serious. I mean, these are people with serious conditions with, uh, with, with uh, really poor states of health. But missing in the management cycle may not have immediate catastrophic consequences. You know, obesity is a serious illness. Uh, and a serious condition. But, you know, the time scale is months and years, not, not days and hours through which you can manage them. And it's important to realize that. Uh, comorbidities in many situations, uh, you know, are, are more kind of uh, mixed in with the primary condition. And so it's a broad definitional uh, 
uh, sort of segmentation here. But it is important to realize this because the way you approach this may be different. Uh, in many situations, intensive management can be easier to control because you know what to do, you know what the primary condition is. And although the population may be smaller, the payback may be bigger from a financial and quality of life perspective because you know it can be, can be dealt with. And often the, the, the consequences can be expensive or, as I said, from a, from a uh, life perspective, uh, pretty, pretty, pretty dramatic. Uh, Non-intensive usually has a bigger population, uh, but it's more difficult to manage sometimes. Uh, it's not saying choose one or the other, but you've got to go into this with your eyes open. And, and an ability to start segmenting chronic disease is very important if you want to drive yourself to value-based healthcare in an organized way. So let's talk a little more about chronic care management. In the end, the way we define chronic care management is that it is a process through which uh, the healthcare systems, system tries to prevent escalation of the disease. So once you baseline a certain condition, someone presents uh, the, himself or herself with a certain chronic condition, you've got a baseline it. What stage is that person in? First, what is the disease? Second, what is the stage? How acute is it? Depending on that level of disease, a care pathway will be designed to prevent escalation. That's the whole point of chronic care management. And it's different depending on what stage you're in. And, and the way you know whether the disease is escalated or not is that you have periodic measurements of defined outcomes. Now, this is a chart that should be something that everyone follows. And to some degree, people do follow, but it's not systematically followed. It's not systematically followed. Uh, the outcomes are not systematically defined. They're not defined in, in, uh, in direct point-to-point -point connection with the stratification of the disease because it's different. Someone uh, who's got uh, late-stage heart failure compared to early-stage heart failure, the outcome measurements are different. The, the period between the outcome measurements are different. Someone who's got, uh, you know, like I said, type 1 diabetes versus type 2. So, and then, you know, you can go on. So the outcome measures have to be precise and they have to be linked to the condition that the patient is in. This is not something that has to be invented. It is something to, that needs to be structured. People know this. Doctors do know this. Uh, but there's a variety of views. Not a lot of variation, but variation. And there is no real uh, uh, method through which adherence is forced. There's no real method through which adherence is measured or even outcomes measured. So it may seem like simple things, but you've got literally billions of people in the world who are kind of facing this. And if it's not done right, the escape rates are very high. And, and escape rates being high adds up to a lot of wastage and a lot of people whose condition actually does escalate because the latest way of uh, thinking and managing is not applied. Uh, and even if it's not the latest way, is whatever way is not structured and applied properly. So it's important to think about chronic care management in that simple a term, that it is, uh, it is a, a process and a care pathway through which disease escalation is prevented. That's the goal. And it's done through periodic measurements of outcomes. Now, you'll come to a condition where the, it is, in fact, escalated. So sometimes, you know, you do the measurements for a reason. You might find that the measurements show that the person's disease condition has gotten worse. Now, sometimes it can be uh, some other kind of problem, like an MI or something like that, that can happen in between outcomes. It can be an emergency measure. You know, there's a variety of reasons why a condition can get escalated. And often that escalation can be treated by a, by a refinement of the care pathway within the chronic care um, you know, treatment uh, methodology and may, may or may not require uh, a, a, an intervention. But there is a certain subset of the population where a more, more serious intervention is required and usually a hospital or a surgical center or some kind of a, a center where intervention is done is required. <clears throat> now, you don't take that lightly. There needs to be a process to assess that level of escalation and uh, there needs to be certain triggers which suggest that that escalation, that that intervention is required. So you've got a, uh, a sort of a decision-making tree which, which, should, which should decide whether that inter intervention is appropriate or not. And then once that's done, you have a pre-operative planning process where the patient is prepared. But not only that, a risk assessment uh, is done of the patient. So, uh, you know, someone might need a, uh, a stent or someone might need a cabbage procedure or someone might need a hip or a knee or, 
uh, a new joint. Uh, while the implant in many ways is the same, in broad uh, sort of ways the, 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 the treatment is roughly the same, the way in which you do it can vary depending on the condition of the patient. You know, are they obese? Do they have diabetes? Do they have other conditions? How, how serious is the condition? Depending on that, you know, you may decide not even to do the surgery. Or if to do the surgery, do it a certain way. Um, not only that, the way in which care for that patient later on uh, would be different. So you have to do a risk assessment first, and then you've got to assign a care pathway that's relevant to that level of risk stratification. That care pathway uh, should include uh, pre-op, the therapy itself, as well as post-operative care. It should also include things like socioeconomic status, because the care pathway may be different for someone who's got care at home and someone who doesn't. Uh, so all those conditions uh, can decide whether to, in fact, do a certain procedure or not, and if you do it, what types of care to provide post-operatively uh, and what kind of planning that needs to happen. But the other important point about the episodic uh, intensive care effort is the fact that the outcome measure for this kind of procedure is quite different from the outcome measure that you employ for regular chronic disease management. Because this outcome measure is really focused on the process of recovery. It's whether you, you've got infections, whether you've got complications, whether um, you, know, you have in fact achieved the goal of the therapy that was intended for. Uh, you know, if there's certain symptoms that the patient came in with and those symptoms were supposed to be relieved by the procedure, have they in fact been relieved? And so the, the nature of the outcome measurements is different from the type of outcome measurements that you have during the chronic care management process. And it's very important not to confuse these because these are quite different. The time horizon over which these uh, uh, outcome measures are made are also different. There are specific times that uh, a procedure uh, typically um, needs to be monitored over because there's an expectation that it takes so long for something to, to heal or recover or, or go through the biological process. That's understood. And so the outcome measure should be made at that time. And typically that's 30, 60, 90 days, maybe longer for a certain type of intervention. So it's very important to be precise about the intensive care effort and it's very important to have accountability and, um, and, and understanding over that entire process and not simply the procedure itself. So there's planning, there's therapy, and there's post-acute care. There's risk stratification, there's outcome measurements, there's time horizons for outcome measurements. All of that has, has to be done, and has to be done on a procedure-by-procedure -procedure basis. Now, the, the other element of this, which many of us are in the middle of, is, is, is technologies. And many of you here are uh, people working in medical device technologies, and we are. And we do, we do technologies that sort of optimize the therapy. Now, that doesn't do the entire procedure, because other elements are required in the procedure for the value of that optimization to be realized. And that's a very important point to note that when we do something, and I'll give you some examples in a minute, of things that improve a therapy, whether that promised improvement is realized or not can only be made when an outcome measure is made of some sort. And so although the therapy itself may be doing one thing, other things also have to happen for the value of that therapy to be realized. And that context should not be lost. But that is different from the management of the entire bundle itself. Because there you've got many things happening, and, and, and in many ways you look at a responsibility for all of that. Therapy optimization is a subset of that. As we've looked at this, we found some, some, some constant themes that have to happen no matter which of these areas uh, one is focused on, whether one is trying to do chronic care management, or one is trying to do episodic care management, or indeed one is simply trying to optimize the therapy. Some things which I've talked about a lot in the last uh, you know, 20 minutes or so that I've been speaking, um, we just put down in a type of framework. Pretty basic, but we're trying to force our team and in our thinking a certain rigor uh, through which we think about value-based healthcare. You start with something as basic as pick a disease or a condition. So it is value-based healthcare can only be done if you pick something because you create value in fixing whatever, you, whatever problem you have. Second, 
You've got to do pick a cohort within that disease. What is the level of risk stratification? You have to be clear about that. Because only after you've picked the, the, the specific cohort, which has to be big enough to give you statistical power, but small enough that you can identify a, a dedicated care pathway to that stratified patient pool. And that's something that needs to be worked out. Because at the end of the day, you know, you could argue that every patient is different. Now, that's not, that's not a process that can be put in place. You've got to have some statistical simplifications here that this group of patients essentially need the same type of care pathway, the identical care pathway. You will get outliers, but that's why you have the statistics, and you've got to know how to deal with the outliers. But that care pathway that's defined by that risk stratification not only defines what you have to do, but in the end you have to decide that how much you'll pay for these things will vary. So a complex patient is more expensive to manage than a, than a less complex patient, than a sim simple case. I mean, that's obvious, but that has to be dealt with. Uh, now, only after you've defined the care pathway can you define the outcome as a result of that care pathway. And the reason I say that is because the expected outcome for different levels of risk stratification is different. You know, you can't expect someone who's seriously ill and you do an intervention to come to the same state of health as someone who's, who's kind of in an early stage and you do a level of intervention, or someone who's very old versus someone who's very young. You are going to get different levels of outcomes. And so those outcomes have to be, have to be detailed according to the care pathway that has been defined. These outcomes also have to be meaningful for patients. And you have to be clear, and I'll talk to that in a, in a minute here. They have to be clear and separated between surrogate measures, like length of stay and things like that, from, from functional measures, which is can a person walk? Or clinical measure, has this you know, joint been fused in the right way, or, or, so, or the spinal, uh, spinal uh, uh, implant being put in place and the, the fusion of the, uh, within the spinal cord done correctly? Does, does that happen the right way? So, uh, you know, there are, there, are, there are different sort of clinical measurements. Has the A1C been managed in a certain way? There's functional measurements, there's quality of life measurements, and, but they all have to be meaningful to patients in some way. And then there are cost measures on top of that. You have to do, through this process, you define a time frame over which these outcomes can be measured. And then through this process, you baseline costs and you baseline outcomes for a certain situation, for a very specific case, for a specific institution. Only then you can start to talk about value. Well, once you've done that, then you can say, well, what improvement am I going to make? And after you do that, you can work on a business model. You know, we're the first culprits in this. You start with the business model. Well, you start with the business model, all you got to do is you walk your way back because it's a meaningless discussion. You know, starting with a business model, you know, what are you talking about? Yeah, sure, I want to do risk sharing. Well, what? How? What are you going to do? And eventually you'll walk your way back. So you might as well start in the beginning. What are you trying to fix? What disease are you trying to do? Which level of patient are you going to do? Do you have the data? Do you have a baseline? What exactly are you going to improve? How are you going to measure it? If you do all of that, you know, the business model is not difficult because if you create value, there's something in it for everybody. There's a win-win. Because if you create value, you share the, the benefits. So that's, that's really not an issue if you do this objectively and systematically. So, you know, the way we've, so we have asked our people, and we're trying to train ourselves and learn about this process, and we're trying to apply this process in virtually everything that we do. You know, what is the patient? What is the risk stratification? What is the care pathway? What is the outcome? Baseline all of that. What's the value proposition? and then go to a business model. And, and that's the process that we're trying to uh, put in place in a fairly rigorous way. It's not as easy as it sounds, because some of these questions don't have black and white answers. And uh, you know, we're all learning as we go along. But you know, we've done, uh, you know, there's actually a list bigger than this, but there's some certain specific areas that we've got uh, more progress than others. Um, and and uh, you know, I'm going to talk in a little more depth about some of them. Uh, but you can see that we've categorized these. Uh, therapy optimization are, are certain things that we do to optimize the therapy itself, but we uh, don't, ha don't have an offering which really um, allows us to take accountability for everything that happens during that episode. Episodic care, we do. 
at that entire intensive care episode where we would uh, have an offering through which we would have accountability for the ultimate outcome and the ultimate cost for that entire period. Not chronic care management, not population, but for that procedure which is usually in a hospital but could be in an outpatient center or, or a surgical center. And you've got examples of that in orthopedics, cabbage procedures, and PCI. And then you've got chronic care management, which, like I mentioned earlier, are, are, are uh, you know, more continued, longer-term uh, management of care. And there, too, we've got certain examples, mostly sort of late stage, although we are working on, um, on, on, on type 2 diabetes as well. But the ones that uh, we've made the most progress in, type 1 diabetes, which I'll talk about in a minute, late stage heart failure, which, which we think uh, is something that we can, um, we, we can manage in obesity, which actually, uh, again, sort of serious levels of obesity that, we, that we're dealing with. But these are all chronic conditions. And what I mean by managing these, that means we're, we're willing to put up risk-based models where we get paid for a fixed fee uh, for that patient uh, for a, you know, on a per year basis, because that's the way chronic care has to work. It's not 90 days, it's like year over year. And uh, we would have outcomes that would, uh, that would uh, kind of define objectively the condition of that patient, outcome measures that we would have to meet. And if we meet those, then we would get a, a payment based on that. Um, and in the episodic care, it's for the entire episode. The therapy optimization is a therapy, but we would build a business model actually around the whole episode. And that is more difficult because you've got other elements in the chain. But let me walk you through these three examples, one in each area. And let me start with uh, uh, what we call uh, the Tyrex, which is an absorbable antibacterial envelope. Uh, this, is a, um, this is a sleeve that is put onto a, to an implantable um, uh, cardiac device, uh, and in like pacemakers or ICDs and, and, and so on. And these, these devices uh, normally carry an infection rate of something like 1% to 4% in typical institutions. Uh, the re-implants have a higher infection rate uh, in general. Um, now, the, the, the consequences are pretty severe when there's an infection. You have 50% mortality at three years. I mean, that, that's, that's pretty significant. 50,000 average cost to treat an infection. So one, one infection and it costs 50,000 to the system. You know, we found as we've tried to do this, that you go into a pay-for-service uh, system, and hospitals often don't care because when they come back to treat the reinfection, they get paid again. So in their, uh, in their uh, financial analysis, they don't even see this as a problem. Well, it's a severe problem. And not only does it cost the system, the payer, and a huge amount of money, look at the mortality rates and the quality of life. And uh, you know, it goes without saying, you know, the, the trauma that you put on someone in their family. So what we have is a sleeve that you put around an implant. And when you put that sleeve on it, then actually we can guarantee that there's virtually no infection at all. So it's a very simple model, which is it's black and white. If there's an infection, we'll pay for the whole thing, not just the, the cost of the implant, we'll pay for the entire 50,000. And if there's no infection, then, then we're fine. When you do a little analysis of this, and I'll walk you through the, the framework in a minute uh, for this product, but for a specific pair in the US, uh, this was like a $36 million cost. And you, when you put the cost of the Tyrex in it, this, this institution would prevent 685 infections and save like $12 million. When you translate this to CMS, to the uh, Medicare, for, for the Medicare population, people over 65 in the United States, these numbers triple. It's more like $130 million in cost. And, and you know, the savings, uh, again, would be like 30 to $50 million. What was what striking to me in this is that this is such a small portion of healthcare. This is a knit. This is an implantable and infections for impl re-implants, usually in infections that happen with an implantable. In the scope of healthcare, all the things that we have to do, this is like nothing. And yet, you get hundreds of millions of dollars sitting there, wasted, not to speak of lives, you know, kind of uh, compromised because of this. So it just, it at least struck me as to the nature of the opportunity and something that is pretty straightforward to do. It goes back to the access problem and the ability to drive something, and I'd much rather do this by saying I'm going to guarantee a result than go and try to convince somebody, hey, here's a feature, and why don't you just use it and try it and do all these things. Instead, say, look, we've got evidence that shows that this works. 
and we will guarantee it. And in this situation, the adherence uh, and process and so on is pretty straightforward. And this is about the simplest value-based healthcare model that you can find. The cohort is very clear. It's patients with implantable devices who are getting re-implants. Very clear cohort. The process adherence and what you have to do is very simple. You put a sleeve on a, on a device. The outcome measure is very straightforward. It's black and white. Do you have an infection? Do you not have an infection? So this is about the simplest model that you're going to get. And even this requires us some time to implement, but one that actually we can move forward with pretty quickly. But it also saves a ton of money kind of doing this. So this is like, uh, you know, sort of kindergarten in the, in the journey of value-based healthcare. It's about the simplest one you can get, and you still have hundreds of millions of dollars in one country with a certain population sitting there. And so you can, you can see the, the, the impact that value-based healthcare can have as you start to make things more complicated. Now, let's go to second grade, which is like cabbage. This is, again, uh, a, this is an intensive care episode in total. This is not simply a therapy optimizer. Now we are saying that we're going to look at patients who've been identified already that they need a cabbage procedure. There's a process that happens before that, which says that, yeah, you're the right person for a cabbage procedure. Once you've identified that patient, you then need to do the risk stratification. You know, are you ready for the surgery? Sure, it indicates that you need surgery, but are you ready? Uh, do you have diabetes? What's your weight? You, all these other things. Socioeconomically, you know, we're going to do the surgery, then what's going to happen to you after that? Are we ready for that? So is it better to do the surgery on you or not? So there's a risk assessment that plans the care pathway. Uh, and then we do the, uh, the, 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 the procedure itself. We have post-discharge, and then we've got disease maintenance. And there's a whole bunch of things that, that, that can be done. Uh, that, that we have that can be done to improve this entire process. And I won't go through that in detail, but we've got uh, things kind of listed here. If you follow the framework, in many ways, this is more understood, more, more difficult to implement. Uh, you know, the cohorts are pretty clear. Risk stratification is important, though, and that has to be done. The outcome measures here are actually understood. Uh, you know, different societies have got these measures, uh, and in general, they're understood but they still have to be standardized uh, through some kind of standardized tool set. Uh, we understand the time frame. There's a time frame that uh, uh, the, the medical community will tell you is required. The experts in this area will tell you that's required for typical recovery from a process like this. Um, in the US, at least, you, you can get claims data that can baseline cost for this procedure. Um, and in other, I'm sure in Canada, you've, you've got that kind of uh, data. And then through the various methodologies that we talked about, we can make a proposal of you know, how we can improve this. And, and, and then you can develop a business model. So you know, we're in the middle of doing this. This is an offering that we're uh, keenly interested in. It's, it's an area where um, in the US, uh, uh, CMS has, um, uh, has said, that, uh, has indicated, is probably uh, a bundle that they will going to make mandatory, that they will start to pay providers only over a 90-day period for all costs. Uh, for re achieving certain types of outcomes, which they will define, which I think they will refine over time. Uh, so, so it's an area of uh, pretty uh, that's important for us and one that we're, we're driving hard and trying to learn ourselves. A lot of things to do, um, and I think we can continue to improve this uh, over time. <clears throat> the third area is a chronic disease measurement, and, and type 1 diabetes is the one that we've picked. And in this situation, we've actually picked pediatric type 1 diabetes. Seems like a small population, but one that, you know, it, the, the care pathways actually are different, whether you're a pediatric type 1 or an adult type 1. You know, the behaviors are different, the needs are different. The, as you can imagine, an adolescent versus, uh, uh, or, or a, you know, an adult uh, versus an infant, you know, you, you manage them differently. And you can recognize that the care pathways are different. All in all cases, you're providing insulin. And you're trying to keep the A1C at a certain level and the glucose levels, uh, you know, at a certain range. The way in which you manage those patients are different, and you're going to recognize that. The costs potentially are different. Um, now, this is a, a model which we, in fact, have got working. And we've got some significant uh, improvements in performance. 82% uh, uh, more patients in glucose control, 9% reduction in yearly cost of care. Uh, and this we've done in the Netherlands where we've taken uh, the pediatric population, worked with a pair, and the pair gives us a fixed fee, a capitated fee for that patient, which is lower than what their original cost was. 
And then every uh, year or two, we kind of uh, look at uh, status. Uh, have we reached the outcomes? What's our current cost? And you know, we're open to improving that cost target. In other words, give the uh, pair you know, more benefit over time because you know, we get better at it over time. We're in the process of scaling this. We've got, we've got a team who actually does the care. We've got a couple of doctors who, who kind of manage this. We're scaling this in the Netherlands to bigger and bigger populations. And, we're, thinking, and we're, we're also studying how to take this outside the Netherlands. So, so the type 1 pediatric diabetes is another area that we've got focus in. You know, we can build up models and all the other things that, that I talked about as well. Late stage heart failure is, is one also that we're very interested in uh, and, and one that we probably will have a program pretty soon. So, you know, all of this, uh, I've talked about outcomes a lot, and it's worth kind of talking about outcomes a little bit, because this is an area which, uh, at least we felt we should put down on paper. Uh, and, and there are really uh, four things that one should look at. The first is clinical, uh, like I mentioned earlier. Has the procedure met expectations from a pathophysiological perspective? What are your markers? Are there complications? Uh, has the disease has there been recurrence? Is it, what's the mortality and morbidity rates? I mean, these are these are clinical objectives that the medical community sets, that the societies have already set as expectations as a result of that care pathway that can be definitively measured and quantified and made completely objective. Then there's functional measurements. That means you know all that is fine, and uh, you know like uh, one example that we find often in the PCI process where uh, you know, you're supposed to treat chest pain or angina, often people complain about angina at the end of the procedure. Well, and yet the doctors say hey, the stent is in there perfectly. I've done the angio, this is all perfect, but the patient still complains about pain. And it has nothing to do with that, maybe something else, it may be psychological, but they show up in the emergency room. There the clinical markers have been met, but the functional measurements have not been met. And in many ways that patient maybe physically is perfectly fine, but doesn't like it. And that's an issue. You haven't met the outcome if the patient is complaining or if the patient has to go back to the emergency room all the time. You know, you can't just say, hey, I did my job. The stent is in there, good. That's the patient's problem. I mean, that's not good enough because it's still, first, it causes the patient stress. Second, it costs the system a lot of money every time they show up in the emergency room for something that they don't need to go there for, and you've got to treat that differently. You've got to manage the, you've got to pay more attention to what has to be done to that patient after discharge. So functional measurements is another area which you cannot take lightly and that has to be met. And that's obviously patient-centric. And then there is just overall quality of life. Has a patient managed to go back to work? Has the patient, uh, you, know, you know, what has been the overall way in which care has been delivered? Uh, what's been the communication like with the providers? I mean, these are all things that are a little softer but have to be measured. But you can't confuse these. Let's not measure, you know, there, there are things that are objective. There are things that are firm. There are things that can be measured. There are other things which are more subjective that, that require a little more judgment. That doesn't mean you cannot structure them, but it's not as black and white an answer as looking at an A1C measurement. And just because you cannot do item three here doesn't mean you can't do outcome measurements. And so, so I think a systematic and organized approach at dealing with this is important. And then there's surrogate measures. You know, things like length of stay and readmission rates are important, but they are measures, essentially measures of cost. They're a result of the things on the top not happening correctly. And so it's not that they shouldn't be measured, but they're not primary clinical measurements, nor are the functional measurements, nor are the quality of life measurements. They're surrogate measures whether those things have happened correctly or not, and usually a reflection of cost. So you know, this is our attempt. I think you know, this is probably highly simplified, especially compared to the depth to which bodies like uh, iCharm uh, can uh, pursue or societies pursue. But I thought at least we'd put this down as a way to think about this and frame the issue and, and create a common language around which we talk. Uh, and at least that's the way we're thinking about it because uh, you know, there's a million, million reasons why this stuff is difficult. But let's start to piece together stuff that we know how to do organize ourselves around it, structure things that we don't know, and kind of bracket them in certain ways. So, you know, how, what, what's been our experience? Our experience has been that uh, when you do this, and not just ours, but, you know, when I've seen other uh, institutions do something like this, 
that if you, you have to include physicians from the very beginning. This is not something that you force down somebody's throat because physicians welcome this. Because like I said earlier, most physicians are doing this anyway. There's just no systematic process that they have to adhere to. I think if you do it properly and they can see objectively through data how they're doing themselves and how their patients are doing, I think they'll in fact uh, welcome that and improve themselves as a result of that. So physicians have to be included in this process and all these different programs will be talked about. We've got physicians in the centerpiece of that who are helping us formulate these processes and we're using physicians to talk to other physicians and other institutions to kind of uh, explain to them what exactly we're doing and the processes that we're employing in their language. So physician presence and input actually is working and we think that's critical. I think there's a growing alignment on, uh, on this type of thinking that we put in place. There's a growing alignment, at least we have a, a clear distinction now between population health and bundled offerings. You know, the term bundled offerings is converging around episodic care management. People are beginning to understand the concept of chronic care, uh, which is different from episodic care. When these concepts are beginning to catch, you know, catch hold in the vernacular of, 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 of healthcare. And we found that our framework, even for us, that's what we know best, is forcing a level of discipline and, and, and common language that, that is improving us. That's improving us, that's forcing us to think more carefully about what we do and how we invest and so on. What are the challenges? Well, you know, many challenges. The healthcare system is highly fragmented. You've got people who are mistrustful of everything, you know, who want to say, you know, it's not my problem. And the, 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 one of the main challenges of value-based healthcare is that, like I said earlier, it cannot be done in isolation. There's no way, no matter how hard Medtronic tries, that we can do this by ourselves. Someone else has to play along with us. And so this requires uh, everyone to step up. And unfortunately, there's still a lot of silos who don't want to go there, who think that, you know, who, who, are, who don't want to, who mistrust, uh, you know, what, everyone is trying to do here in this journey, saying that, hey, you know, just leave me alone, you guys fix it. That won't work. So the silo mentality has to be broken down. I think incentives have to move much more quickly. I, I, and my, my plea to administrators, healthcare administrators, and, and payers everywhere, uh, here in Canada, in the US, commercial payers, everybody, move decisively, quickly, and systematically. This is not an area where you can take like baby steps because, or try to kind of do things and see what happens uh, in one area because there's loopholes elsewhere. This is not an area that you can move quickly in just by encouraging people to do certain activities. I'm not discouraging that, but in the end of the day, doing activities is not always going to ensure an outcome. What I mean is that, you know, incentivize someone to always take blood pressure for certain conditions and pay them if they've done the blood pressure measurement, and if they haven't, you penalize them. Again, I'm taking that as a random example, but there are things like that that are going on. While that may, blood pressure measurement in that care pathway may be an essential metric, if you do all the blood pressure measurements according to what you're asked, and the outcome isn't there because something else has gone wrong, you know, that hasn't achieved anything. The story I tell, from a business perspective, which uh, you know, is, is somewhat humorous but, but very telling, is that um, you know, when we, uh, we have a sales force and we pay the sales team, we pay them based on you know, how much sales they get. If I paid them instead for how many sales calls they make, I don't think I'd get the sales. I'd get a lot of sales calls and I'd spend a lot of money, but I'm not sure I'd get the sales. But we pay them on the sales. And so sales is the outcome in this situation. And so you've got to measure people on the, on the result. And they can be processes that you encourage them with, but be careful, that is not the answer. So incentives have to, have to move, and we have to move decisively to an outcomes-based system. And, and in my view, you know, take one area, do it properly. Do it all the way. And then do another area, do it all the way. Rather than try to do everything together, because you cannot. You know, delegating a population health metric and say that I'm going to pay you X amount for every patient in your population is fine. But the easy answer to that is just pick healthy people or not do anything. 
And, and you cannot approach value-based healthcare in that way. You've, you've just had, there's no excuse. And there's no other avenue rather than roll up your sleeves and work this. And if you work it, it can be done. And there's enough resources and money that we're spending in healthcare that, you know, this is not extra money in many ways. It's a, it's a, it's a reorientation of where we spend. I think we do have to work uh, data and analytics. I do think, though, that that cannot be, again, the reason why we can't do anything. There's plenty of stuff you can use. You can use claims data. You can use surrogate measures. There's lots of things that we can do to get started. This, the start in areas where you do have data. You know, don't use this as a reason that I need the world's biggest big data infrastructure and all this stuff before I do anything. Eventually, you might need that. But there's plenty available to get, get on with stuff. I think risk models uh, is another one where, uh, you know, <laughs> we found often that uh, you've tried to do these arrangements and, uh, with, with certain institutions, and we all agree that the risk model is the right one, but we get the lawyers in a room, and it's more difficult to write a risk-based model than it is to say, okay, don't worry about it. I'll just trust that the thing will happen. I'll just pay you for it. So, you know, risk-based models are somewhat difficult sometimes, and, and sometimes what happens is, uh, is uh, you know, there, there, there are, uh, there are uh, legislation that actually prevents you from driving some kinds of models because they were put in place. You know, for example, uh, there are restrictions on how much care we can provide directly, uh, how much accountability we can have for care, for the right reasons. So we have to understand those and then, and then change the legislation accordingly. And then again, you know, you cannot kind of drive this. You cannot force this on physicians. You know, you've got, an, and by customer, I mean the broad customer. Your customers are everyone's customer. Your partners in many ways. Understanding their mindset. And this cannot be forced on somebody. This has to be understood. You know, and this is my final slide. Um, why is this relevant for Medtronic? Well, I, I, I said that in many words, but why do we think we can make a difference? Well, first, because we can use technology to make this process sustainable. We can use technology in many areas. It'll be the right use of technology. Second, we've got clinical trial and healthcare economics expertise that is highly relevant to things like cohort selection, outcomes definition, care pathway definition. That's what we do in clinical trials all the time. And we've got a lot of expertise in that area. We just need to translate those set of expertises to the real world. Um, and then, you know, we can take this step by step. We don't have to go all the way through, and that's why we've tried to delineate this between simple stuff like Tyrex, complicated things like a cabbage procedure, uh, you know, perhaps long-term areas like type 2 diabetes, all of which we can handle, but we can walk our way there. You know, that's really all I have to say. I, I hope uh, it's been useful. Uh, I've certainly found it useful, kind of, if nothing else, putting this together. Uh, you know, I don't know how much time we have, we have left, but I'd love to uh, get a few questions and, uh, and enter into at least a short dialogue. Thank you very much for your attention. Do you have time for a few questions? Sure. What are your questions from the audience before we conclude? I think there's, there's mics. There we go, yeah. Thank you very much for an excellent presentation. Uh, my question relates to the levels of outcome measurements that you have with um, uh, the patient reported and the clinical yeah. satisfaction. Um, do you have a uh, a, a formula for how you balance those as to which one of those wins. Because many times when we look at those different levels of outcomes and measure them, they're going in different directions. So sometimes a patient might really love something, um, a technology, but clinically we don't see a change once they've been using it. So do you have um, a, a formula for what you look at when you're developing a technology and which one of those is a winner or is it a balance? Well, first, you know, we're not experts at this, so we're just trying these things. But our, uh, our uh, sort of um, bias, if you like, in that area is that, uh, you know, th there's no winners. You've you got to weight them. You've got you to weight them because, um, you know, if certain things have been met, you can't, you can't discount it. You know, if a clinical marker has been met, that's an important criteria. That means something has been done right. Mm -hmm. And if nothing else, the problem is elsewhere. Uh, it may be that they didn't need the procedure to start with, but, uh, but uh, you know, I think you've got to weight all of them in, in, in a certain way to get the appropriate result. Um, you know, I don't know any other way to do it. We don't have enough experience 
to really find out. Um, at this stage, the, the places that have actually done it, uh, you know, the, the actual quality of life metric has had a higher weight than anything else. Mm -hmm. Primarily because uh, bears in general and governments and so on in general kind of react to that the most. How does a patient feel in the end? And, and in the end, if you do everything else and that doesn't work, that does, uh, kind of tends to override. But th the reason I hesitate to make that kind of all-encompassing is because that's a good excuse for doing nothing, because that's the most difficult to measure. Yeah. Uh, and I think the others go a long way in, in, in taking you there. And if, the, if all of the other things have been met and the patient's still not happy, it just says that there's some other kind of problem. Right. Okay. So, so that's the way we think about it. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, please. Hi, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, my name is Rose Young. I'm an endocrinologist, actually, mm. and a health services researcher. And I'm wondering about your thoughts on um, the fact that poverty is the number one determinant of health and concerns about case mix with regards to um, lining up incentives with uh, Yeah. Well, well the two different questions. So, uh, uh, the first, uh, you know, that's what I meant by uh, risk stratification. That's case mix. I think case mix is critical because that will determine the care pathway. And in fact, what I'm saying is that the socioeconomic status has to be built into the case mix because that's going to change. The care pathway, especially post-acute care, uh, is, uh, is, determined, you know, is highly determined by, uh, by the type of uh, you know, poverty level or whatever those, those patients are under. Uh, I do think, uh, you know, it's a little counterintuitive, but I do think that even for businesses like us, that population is in fact a big opportunity. Because I think a lot of money is spent there, uh, aside from the, f because you know, especially in the developed world, you know, people when they show up at hospitals, they get treated. And they don't get treated that well, and it's expensive, and they go back to conditions which are uh, not right. And, and, and maybe the answer there is uh, you do do other things like uh, social improvements and, uh, you know, buy them a uh, you know, house or give them somewhere to live or wh whatever. I mean, there or give them other types of care. You know, I was uh, told a story by uh, one of my colleagues who runs an insurance company that the... Uh, that their highest cost on a per patient basis in the US was a patient who was actually costing them $2 million a year, one patient. And that patient happened to have multiple visits to the ER a, a week. And what was going on was this patient was, uh, uh, was living in a house which was slightly cold, and she uh, liked to use this uh, particular type of uh, shawl, which had a fur of some sort in it. And she was allergic to that. That was all that was going on. And she was showing up at the hospital and we were giving her all kinds of things which were making it worse. Uh, and so this is not quite poverty, but it goes to show that, uh, you know, things like this happen. And this, this is a colleague, I mean, he tells a story publicly. So, uh, uh, you know, it's not us. It's, a, it's an insurance company, actually, where, where this happened. But again, I think poverty, uh, you know, that should feed into the case mix. And I do think that that's... Uh, that, that's an area where we can make a big difference. Uh, one final story on that. We, we've, we're doing a program right now on, uh, on, uh, on patients who present themselves without insurance, without any funding, into a certain, in, in Methodist San Antonio actually, uh, who present themselves in the emergency room with a type two condition. And we're taking that as a cohort. And we're, we're managing that. And we're finding just incredible improvements in, uh, in A1C, in uh, other markers. Uh, just by providing dedicated care and baselining their disease. So I, I think actually poverty is an opportunity. There's a lot of money being spent there, and if instead we channel that money in a more intelligent way, I think it would make a big difference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm.